Well, good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here with us today. We are in the last of uh, this series, God's at War. And if you're coming in for the first time in this series, you've come on a good day. I've saved the best for last, I hope. And um, actually what we've been tackling is these these little demigods that we don't really uh, think about much. We're not really aware of that are all around us, that are vying for our affections, our time, our our, just our lives in general. And we've talked about uh, not the little statues, the carved graven images, carved, carved of wood or stone. We've not talked about, you know, the, the little fat Buddhas on our whatever and the, wherever they might be in a restaurant or whatever. We're not talking about those kinds of idols. We're talking about other idols, idols of power, idols of pleasure, idols of money, idols of self. We've talked about just the opportunities that are there and afforded to us, particularly in the United States of America, and how actually they're after you and they're after me. we, We face these, and oftentimes we don't even recognize that they're there. That's for sure. Now, a few years ago, probably about two actually, um, my uh, former Bible school roommate, who I roomed with back in the early 80s, um, we uh, had gotten contact with one another, and he was he lives in California, but he was flying into the D.C. area, and he invited me to come up and meet with him. He was staying at his brother's house. And so I drove up to D.C., and we had room for a number of years while we were in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And while I was there... Um, we had you know, plenty of time to talk. I remember we went on some walks and just, just talked about what life things were going on. And one of the things that I noticed, uh, and, it, and it, just, it you know, just sunk my heart, was that he was nowhere near where he should have been and could have been in his walk with God. In fact, he admitted to me that uh, the world had gotten the best of him. He admitted to me that there were things that happened in his life that caused him to fall away from God. Actually, what happened, part of what happened was he, he got divorced, but then he got remarried, and he got married to, remarried to a Hollywood star. If I told you this a woman's name, you, all of you would know who it is. And um, he told me that in a, you know, in a roundabout way, uh, indirect ways, and then some direct ways, that he had just just gotten sidetracked, that God was no longer at the center of his life. And I wonder for you, if, if you've ever personally been stunned, shocked, disappointed, when you found out that somebody that you know or knew and loved and cared about had actually taken a turn away from God, where at one time they used to serve God, at one point in their life, at least that you know of, they were fervent for God. They were hot for God. They were, they were serving in church. They were giving. They were taking their time. But now, for some reason, this person may have even taught the Bible someplace in a Sunday school class or someplace in the church or in a small group. Um, but they've fallen away. I, I don't know about you, but when, when I see that, it bothers me deeply. But the truth is, it's no great mystery as to why that takes place. In fact, the truth is, you and I could look at our very own lives and find out why, if we thought about it, we took time to think and consider, why have I kind of fallen aside, falling away? I used to be here, but now I'm here. The truth is, in the Christian life, you're either growing up and to the right or you're declining. You're never neutral. You're never just steady. You're either growing or what you would say you are declining or backsliding or whatever you want to uh, term that. But why is that? The Bible says it's actually not a mystery at all to us. In fact, let's look at uh, this first passage of Scripture. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at verse 9 and then verse 10. It says this, Make every effort to come to me soon. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He's talking to Timothy. Timothy, I want you to join me. I, 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 I'm in prison right now. I want you to come and join me. I'm not doing real well in that regard because I'm in chains for Christ because of what I'm doing for him. All right? And so he says, come to me soon. Why is that? Because or for Demas has deserted me. Because he loved this present world. Uh, Right there, I see what we're going to be talking about today. The gods 
of this cosmos. The gods of this cosmos. It says, make every effort to come to me soon. Why is that? Because my bud, Demas, has forsaken me because he loved this present world. It's interesting, if you look at this guy, Demas, you'd find that there are three mentions of him in the Apostle Paul's letters. And it may well be that in his latter life, he became shipwrecked in regards to his faith and his walk with God because of the gods that we're going to look at today. In Philemon chapter 1, don't turn there, but you can if you have your phone, you want to, but in chapter 1, verse 24, he is listed, that is Demas, is listed amongst a group of men who Paul called his fellow laborers. In other words, when you have somebody who's working beside you, standing beside you, working with you shoulder to shoulder, doing ministry, doing work for Christ, that's a fellow or co-laborer. And the Apostle Paul said, he's my bud. He's right here. He's beside me. He's doing ministry with me. He's an important guy. This is the guy who's making a difference in the world. That's Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. And then it says in Colossians 4.14, Demas' name is mentioned, but without any comment at all. And then finally, we see that here it's listed, that he has forsaken Paul because he loved the present world. You see this delineation of, of this de-evolution, this spiraling downward of why somebody fell away from Christ. First Demas, the fellow laborer, then Demas, just his name, and finally Demas, the deserter who loved the world. Again, the history of spiritual degeneration. Bit by bit, this fellow laborer has become the deserter. The one who had a title of honor, a co-laborer, a fellow laborer, has now got a name of dishonor. And this could happen to any one of us. Don't think it couldn't happen to you. It could happen to you. It could happen to me. Unless you know how to avert it. And believe it or not, the God of this world the God of this age, the Bible, Jesus terms him the God of this world, Satan, the devil, the God of this age, this present age. He has his sights set on you, and he has his sights set on me, and his aim is to get at us, is to get us to uh, be per people who are off mission. He wants us to be people who are off the mission God's got for us to follow instead a pseudo mission. He's looking to get his aim to get us off track, to get on a different track. His aim is to get us disengaged with a lifestyle of service to God and engaged in a lifestyle of service to self. His aim, Satan's aim, the God of this world, the God of this age, the the aim of Satan is to get us disinterested in God's plans and purposes and to get us entirely interested in our own plans, pursuits, and interests. And there's only one way to keep from falling in love with this present world system, this way of life, and that, that's contrary to God. And the answer is given to us in a unique way in this uh, passage that we're going to look at in both a positive and a negative way. In other words, if you are ever going to be kept from falling into some sort of uh, de-evolution in walking with God, your walk is spiraling down. And to avoid and avert that, there's, there's instruction for us in Scripture and basically, this instruction comes with a positive and a negative, or a negative and a positive sort of uh, instruction. So it's basically two sides of the same coin. And so what I want to do is talk with you about what that answer is. John points out, as we'll see in just a moment, that this world system that we live in today, this the way the world works today, it's called, it's called in Greek, the cosmos. In, in English, it's transliterated and into cosmos, the cosmos, the world system. And we're going to look at that pretty hot and heavy, really hard here today, because this cosmos or this cosmos, 
the way we would say it here today, um, uses three devices to get us to fall away from God, to get us to fall away from Christ, where Satan can use this world system to allow us, to cause us to um, infect us, if you will, with a love for these, one of these three things. And we all have battles with these. Every one of us, there's nobody who doesn't have a battle with this. And here's what it is. The Bible talks about it. It's the lust of the flesh, it's the lust of the eyes, and it's the pride of life. Let's read this passage of Scripture where it points this out. This is in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 through 17. Here's what it says. Follow along with me on the screen. It says this, Stop loving the world and the things that are in the world. This is the Apostle John speaking now. Stop loving the world and the things that are in the world. Quit it. If anyone persists in loving the world, the love of the Father is not in him or her. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is of the world or from the world. And the world and its desires are fading away, but the person who does the will of God or God's will remains forever or lives forever. Now what I'd like to do here is I would like to take that, those few verses and I would like to just really talk with you about this. It's important stuff. And so let's go back to verse 15 in 1 John chapter 2, and here's what it says. Stop. Stop is the first word. And it's, a, the, it's a present imperative. It's a command in Greek to stop at once what they have been doing. So basically God says, quit it. Knock it off. Stop loving. John is God speaking through John, stop loving what you're loving right now because it's going to ruin you. It's going to ruin you in such a way that you're going to fall in love with something that is passing away and won't last and is unreliable. And you're falling away in the one, from the love of the one who actually redeemed you and created you to begin with. So he says, stop loving the world. Now let's talk about this idea of what this world is that we're to stop loving. Because you may not know you're loving it. And you might not be loving it. But then again, you and I might be. So what's he mean by this? Well, in the New Testament, the word world translated the Greek cosmos. We understand it as, like I said, cosmos. is used six times in just these three verses, but it's used more than 180 times in the New Testament and over 100 times in the writings of John. The scripture uses the word world or cosmos to denote Four different th- three, three major different things. Number one is the universe or the heavens and the earth. That is the planet earth. The heaven, the things that God created. And he uses that. The universe, the heavens, and the earth. The second thing that the world, word world denotes in scripture is the world of mankind. That is, it's the, it's the world in which mankind is a part of. Male, female, boys, girls. This world that particularly is the one that God died for, Jesus died for, I should say, where in John 3, 16, uh, we know, for God so loved the world, the world of men, the world of mankind, the world of women, the world of people is the idea there. He, he is said to have, have given his uniquely born son for it. The Bible says it's his object, the world is, the cosmos is, his ob- object of saving, his saving purposes, that Jesus gave himself as an atonement for it, that he is the savior of the world. That's the second way that the word world is used in scripture, cosmos or cosmos. It's, it's the universe, it's the creation, it's also the world of mankind, but what John is using it for here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17 is neither of those. He actually uses it in the third way, which is the most powerful way and the way that uh, John most powerfully uses it throughout his writings. If you're going to compare, God did save, Jesus did come to save, but, God, but G- John talks about it in a different way more than these other ways throughout his writings, and we find it's the third way, and it's the world order of things as opposed to the kingdom of Christ. It's the world system. The world system. The way things are. The way things work in the world. The cosmos is best defined, and you can see this on the screen, 
as this. All of that floating mass of thoughts, opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, and aspirations at any time current in the world and which is contrary to God. Now, if you look at that list, you've got to see that most of this is about attitudes. It's about the way, listen, this is super important, it's about the way you think and the way I think. Do you have a Christian worldview or do you have a world worldview? Do you have a biblical worldview? Is that your view or do you have, this is what I learned at school, worldview? Do you have a professor worldview? Do you have a my boss worldview, my husband worldview, the blog worldview, the Facebook? What kind of a worldview do you have? The Fox News worldview or CNN or MSNBC? What kind of worldview do you possess? See, because whatever worldview you possess, it means you've got ideas about that and from that. And from your ideas is what you turn out to be and do. Because you do and you become what you believe. And if you believe a certain way from the ideas you receive, you're going to act a certain way. So you live out, or I live out, worldly ways, ways that are opposed and contrary to God, based upon the ideas and the information and the things that I've received that I now believe or am adopting and embracing in life. So what is the world system? It is all of that floating mass of thoughts and aims and aspirations and maxims and speculations and opinions. All of that that's contrary to God's way. And believe it or not, my friend, you and I are people who have been sucked into that. We begin to believe that. Why is that? Well, we're going to take a look at why that is and how to avoid not becoming people who have gained their ideas, their values through the world system. We don't want that to take place, even though some of us you know, are neck deep in it. Demas obviously was. Now, when Christians are said to um, not love the world or anything in the world, he's not thinking so much of materialism or material things as he's thinking of worldly attitudes that lie behind the, all the things contrary to God and what his word, the Bible, says. John Wesley said, anything, listen to this, anything that cools my love for Christ is of the world. Say that again. Anything that cools my love for Christ is of the world. Again, this has little to do with loving stuff. It has little to do with loving things or certain, loving certain places or loving certain lifestyles, but rather it's about the attitudes that produce the love for stuff and the love for things and the love for certain places or lifestyles. So John says to stop loving the world. Now, notice, let's look a bit at the screen again. Stop loving the world, that order of system, the way the world does stuff, the way the world thinks and wants you to think with them. Stop it. Watch. Stop loving the world and the things that are in the world. The things that are in the world. What is the thing? What are the things? It's whatever in its connection, its tendency, and its influence of the, of the worldly things is hostile to God or Christ or to his kingdom. No matter how alluring no matter how attractive it may otherwise appear to be, it is a thing of the world. If it is something that is contrary or hostile or opposed to God. He says, stop loving the world or the things in the world. Now watch this. If anyone persists in loving the world, if any believer persists or any person, I should say, persists in loving the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what is he telling us here? This is a hypothetical situation where John says, if, if you're a person who loves the world and doesn't care about God, you love the world and, and, and you don't, it, it doesn't bother you one bit what the world's like, and, and you're in love with it, 
You can't be in love with God who's opposed to it at the same time. And he's just saying, hypothetically so, that that person does not have a relationship with God. Now, that might make you mad, but don't be mad at me. I'm just reading what John said here. John is hypothetically saying, if you're madly in love with the world, if that's what your whole focus is about, this is how I do life, and you're not interested in much at all, or anything at all, in pleasing God, and doing things His way, following His plan, then you can't yet, you don't yet have a relationship with God. You're not saved. You're not going to heaven at that point. Your sins are not forgiven. Because what, what is he telling us? Because you have not had a change on the inside of regeneration. You might know about church. You might know about God. You might know about Jesus. You might know about the cross. You might know about religion, but you don't know the one who created you personally yet. And you don't know the one who redeemed you yet. You, the one who paid for your sins. You might know of him, but you don't know him. So you can't be a person who persists in loving the world and love the Father at the same time. It's not possible. He just said so right here. Why is that? He answers the question. For everything, here's why you can't be like that. Here's why it won't work. Here's why it can't work. Because everything, generally everything, that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's of the world. So let's take a look first at this first part. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Now let's talk about lust for a moment. We have Americanized that word. It doesn't mean what you think it means oftentimes. Sometimes it does. Lust doesn't necessarily mean sexual things. Although it can mean that. The word lust in Greek here is epithumia, which means a strong craving, strong passion, a strong desire. It has nothing to do with anything in particular except that it's a strong desire. And here he says, what's part of this world system that God is saying, don't love, don't let it be a demigod to you, don't let it be a God that vies for your affections and wins. He says, there's this, this lust of the flesh, strong desire of the flesh. But when he says flesh, he doesn't mean the skin. Oftentimes we think flesh, that's a sexual thing. No. Flesh means the old Adamic nature, the depraved nature, the fallen nature of mankind. It's the nature that causes you to want to do what you want to do, and me to do what I want to do. See, it has little to do with one thing in particular, but everything generally. It is, it is a strong desire to let myself win and get whatever I want, have whatever I want, no matter what it is, whether it's contrary to God or not, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to have what I have. I want to get what I get. It's a lust of the flesh. It's a strong desire. If I want that, I'm going to have that. If I can, you know, whether I go into debt or not, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get that. That's mine. I'm going to have it. I want it. The TV said I have to have it. The commercial told me I, I need to own this or else. It's, 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 it's not just that. It's it's stuff that you personally want or I personally want from our fallen nature. Again, it has nothing to do necessarily with my skin, with my physical body. It has to do with the desires of my sinful self. So he says, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. That's one thing. And then he says something else. Well, I guess, let me just say this. Before I get into the, the lust of the eyes, let me say this about the, the lust of the flesh. You can have, there is nothing wrong with your human cravings. There's nothing wrong with your human desires, I should say. But when it becomes inordinate, when it becomes something of out of balance, something that becomes greater than it ought to be, that's when it becomes polluted or depraved in some capacity. So for instance, um, God has given us certain desires and they're good. I mean, hunger is not a bad thing. Thirst is not a bad thing. Weariness, being tired, is not a bad thing. Sex is not a bad thing. These are not evil in and of themselves. There's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and sleeping and enjoying your spouse. It's when the flesh controls the flesh nature controls these things that they become lusts. 
So now, hunger isn't evil, but gluttony is sinful. In fact, I think that's probably the only sin in America that Christians tolerate. Gluttony. Well, I got quiet in here, man. Thirst is not evil, but drunkenness is a sin. Sleep is a gift from God, but laziness is shameful, isn't it? Sex is God's precious gift when used rightly, but when used wrongly, it becomes immorality. So you can see how the world operates. It appeals to the normal appetites and then tempts us to satisfy them in ways that, prefer, that, that pervert God's original intent. Now, it's important that a believer remember what God says about the old nature, the flesh. God says everything about the flesh is negative in the Bible. Everything God says about the old sin nature, the, the Adamic nature, the, the fallen nature is bad. God says, in the flesh there is no good thing, Romans 7, 18. It says, the, pro the flesh profits nothing, John 6, 63. That Christians are to put no confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3, 3. That we're not to make plans to satisfy the desires of the flesh, Romans 13, verse 14. So you can see that, that loving the world means that you are taking the, the desires of the flesh to a new level. A dominating level, where it's dominating you, it becomes a God of this world. And God says, don't love the world, nor the things in it. Because all that's in it is the lust of the flesh. And then he says the next phrase, and the lust of the eyes. Now, the lust of the eyes is an inordinate, excessive desire for things, for possessions, for stuff. You see it, and you got to have it, whatever it is. It's distinct from the lust of the flesh in that the lust of the flesh doesn't have to see it. It just wants what it wants. You can hear about it. But the lust of the eyes is you see something, and now you see it, i got to have it. Now, having things is not bad, necessarily. But it could be for you. <laughs> it depends on what's dominating you. Do you have to have it? Then you probably shouldn't. If you have to have it, that's called the lust of the flesh. It's a strong, I mean, it's the lust of the eyes. It's a strong desire that the eyes. Remember Eve? She saw that the fruit was good and was able to make one wise, was good to eat, and she partook of it. The lust of the eyes is good to eat. It's, I want it. And then this last one is the pride of life. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, my strong desires of whatever I want, the lust of the eyes, what I see I want, and the pride of life. She saw, Adam, uh, Eve saw that it was good for food and able to make one wise, the pride of life. I want to be wise. Not God's way, my way. See, I want that, the pride of life. The pride of life is kind of really what it says, pride in your life. You know, there is the pride of self-sufficiency, the Bible says. There's the pride of wealth. There's the pride of position. There's the pride of power. Pride has a lot of faces to it. There's the pride of intelligence. There's the pride of knowledge. There's the pride of conceit. There's the pride of self-glory. There's the pride of self-righteousness. See, the baby even said so. The pride of self-righteousness. Let me tell you what I think. I translated this, this phrase, pride of life, sort of into street talk, I guess, because we don't really talk like, you have the pride of life in you. We don't really say that. So I kind of just made something up that is accurate, but it's more street talk, okay? And it's this. Strutting your, what's the pride of life? It's strutting your stuff. It's strutting your stuff. Excuse me, strutting yourself by strutting your substance and your stuff. It's strutting yourself by strutting your substance and your stuff. Your substance is who you are, and your stuff is what you've got. And when you strut that, that's called the pride of life. You strut yourself by strutting your substance, who you are, your power, your position, your wealth. You're strutting that and you're strutting your stuff. Here's what I've got. Look at my helm. Look at my cars. Look at what I dress like. Look at what I own. 
Look at how much money I've got. I got to go do this. And you strut that around, and this is the pride of life. And man, I have some, I have some uh, jerseys that from playing a cornhole that you know I'm probably near a pro level, and it's got my name on the back. And you know the truth is, I have to, I have to be careful in my own heart that I'm not strutting my stuff when I put that jersey on to think I'm so cool. Better than most players. It's just a stupid thing. Or playing ball. Or whatever you do. There, there's pride that lurks itself out in so many areas of our lives. Ladies, it's how you look and what jewelry you've got. What shoes you've got and the purse you've got. You see, and, and for us guys, it's, it's what, what are we driving? Did you see my new truck? I got a truck. No, I didn't. I'm just saying. That's what we say. It's right there, isn't it? I mean, it's just right in our face. And here's what, here's what John says. John says, by the Spirit of God, that if you're going to love God, you can't be in love with that sort of thinking. It'll eat you alive. It'll eat me alive. And you know, it, it, it wrestles me all the time, these things. Lust of the flesh. My strong desire to do what I want to do. Lust of the eyes. I see that. I want to have that. I'd like that shirt. That'd be a cool shirt to have. Or whatever. And the pride of life. I want to strap my stuff. Do, do you see how that is all contrary to what Jesus taught? All of that is. How did Demas fall from where he was as a co-laborer to loving this present world? He fell because he started to fall in love with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And the vain glory of life. That's what happened. He says, in the pride of life, he says, it is not from the Father, but it's from the world. These three things, these three things, these, these demigods, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not from the Father but it's from the world. Its origin stems from the world, the world system, the created order or disorder, what, the, the way we created this order of stuff. That is the world. It's not just the uh, United States of America. It's, it's other na nationalities and countries and whatnot. <clears throat> a survey from a, a leading Christian magazine ranked Areas of greatest spiritual challenge to Christians. Now listen to this. This is quite interesting. The first greatest temptation for, for Christians, according to this magazine, was number one, materialism. Number two, pride. Number three, self-centeredness. <laughs> and I read that and I go, wow. That's lust of, the lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Boom. 81% of the respondents noted temptations were more potent when they had neglected their time with God. And then John goes on to say in verse 17, we'll wrap up with this verse here, and he says, and the wor in, in this passage here, and the, the world and its desires are fading away. The world and its desires, these lusts, are passing away. What's he saying? It's now in the act of passing away. It's about to. Its very nature is not to last. Its doom is about to overtake it. Its flowers are withering. The world system, its promises are failing. Its hopes are crumbling. Its glamour and its glory and its glitter are all fading away. And then he says... Here's the other side of the same coin, the positive side. But the person who does God's will remains forever. Now, what I think I would like to do is just tell you, there's, I'm, I'm going to just quickly go by this because there's a, one more passage that's just prior to this that I want to get to. And that's simply, I want to say before I get to that passage is this. There's two reasons to divorce. There's two reasons to divorce the gods of this cosmos. Two reasons to divorce if you're in love, like Demas has been in love, or 
are on your way to loving more of the world than you really know you ought to and don't really want to go there, but you see yourself leaning that way, there's two reasons you ought not. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, first is this, that love for God and love for the world and love for the Father are not compatible. They're just, they just can't mix. God is opposed to what you and I are loving and it's not compatible. So you really just have to make a choice. Do I want to love God and, and see his favor in my life? Or do I just kind of want to love the world so much and go my own way? When you go your own way, but well, listen, before you came to Christ, you were on that road. You, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to go back to that. You've been there, down there. Got the t-shirt. You got a bunch of t-shirts. Your whole drawers are filled with t-shirts of the past life. Don't, keep, don't go back. Don't love the glamour and the glitter and all that's out there because it's a lie. It lasts that long. The second reason that we need to divorce the gods of this cosmos is that all that is in the world is transitory. It's headed for destruction. Again, the world's passing away. The world's passing away. How foolish it would be then to pin our hopes on the world system no matter how attractive it is, no matter how rewarding it may seem to be, don't pin your hopes on that because it will not last. A man once said to the great preacher D.L. Moody, he said, now that, I am con- now that I'm converted, must I give up the world? And the great D.L. Moody said, no, you don't need to give up the world. If you give a ringing testimony for the Son of God, the world will give you up pretty quick. <laughs> they won't want you around. Now that raises a practical and important question about the the nature of Christians and how to keep from getting worldly. The answer is found in the unusual form of address found in the prior verses to where we just read. And I'm going to close with this today. Let me say this again. How do you, how does God say to you and to me that Steve, And you put your name there. If you want to avoid loving the world and not being trapped by the gods of this cosmos, of this present age in which we live, how do you keep yourself safe from that? Then God has his answer for you, and it's found in two verses prior to this. So we read verses 15, 16, and 17. What we're going to do now is read verses 12, 13, and 14, and it gives us our answer. Here it is. Let's look. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what he says. Little children, I write to you because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Verse 13. Fathers, I write to you because you have known him who is from the beginning. He's not talking about spirit. He's not talking about earthly fathers or children, kids. He's talking about those in the faith. Ages or maturity in the faith. Now, this is super important. He starts off by saying children, and he uses a Greek word that means uh, uh, comes from a child who is nursing. This is an infant child, the first one. Children, I, I write to you because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I want you to know I'm writing to you those because you know that, and this is all you know, that your sins are forgiven. That Because you're just a newborn Christian. You just came to faith. That's all you know, practically, is your sins are forgiven. And then he says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Fathers, I write to you because you have known him. And the idea is you've known God experientially. You're mature now. You're not new in the faith. You've experienced so much of God because you've hung with him. You've, you've, you've been with him. You've, you've lived the life that he's wanted you to live. And now you know him. You've come to know him through experience. Not just random experience, but experience of spending time with him, of being in his word, of letting his word live in you. And now you've come to such a mature part of your life that you are strong in God and you know him. You just, you just know God. That's the idea. Just, I know God. I don't have to try to like, do I know him? Am I sure? I'm not sure what he's like. No, these these spiritual fathers, they they just, they know God. 
And then he says, young men, I write to you because you have defeated the evil one. We'll get back to that in a second. Then he says again, children, I write to you because you have known the father. Now he turns the word from brephos, which is a child who's, who's nursing, to technon, the Greek word, or technia, which means a child under instruction. And here's what he tells us. He says, I'm writing to you now. First, I wrote to the children who were just nursing, just knew their sins were forgiven. Then I said, fathers, I'm telling you, you've known God who is from the get. You know him. Young men, I write to you. These are young men in the faith, young women in the faith. These are people in the faith who are kind of growing in their walk with God and they're winning in victory over the world and over Satan. And he says, I, I write to you because you're strong. You're strong. You've defeated the evil one. And then he goes back and says, I write to you, children, those of you now who are not just babes and just know your sins are forgiven, but now you're a child, listen, who's under my instruction, the instruction of God, not John's, the instruction of God. I write to you, children who are under instruction, because you have known the Father. You're coming to know him. That's the idea, because you're under his instruction. And then he says, fathers, I write to you because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he repeats that again. And here's what I want to get at. How did the one who came to faith and just knows their sins are forgiven, a, a, a newborn babe in Christ, come to be a father? How did that person come to grow to be a father, to become somebody or our mother, let's say it like that, just somebody who knows Jesus God, well, personally, intimately, closely, and walks with him, or he's not, or she's not having to try to stir up faith or get faith to arise, is there because they've been with God. How did that happen? The answer, and the answer to keep from falling into the world system and loving the world, is found in verse, the last part of verse 14. And here's what he says Young men, now this can be translated young strong ones. So male, female, doesn't matter. Young men, young women, I wrote to you because you are strong and God's word remains in you and you have overcome the defeat or defeated the evil one. The idea here is that they are strong because the word of God abides in them. And the result is presently that they're standing on Satan's neck and have overcome the world. The point in all of John's teaching here today is if you're not going to love the cosmos, if you're going to keep from falling into its trap of it, its lure for you to follow it, then you've got to be a child of God who's under the instruction of God's word and you're getting the word in you so much, you're strong like the young person, there, God's word remains in you and you've overcome the wicked one and the world with the present result that you're standing on Satan's neck and you keep that word coming in you so much so that you become a spiritual father in the faith. And that, my friend, is the only way to avoid and to avert the destruction that Satan wants for you. He does want you to go on his track. He does want you to love the world. He does want me to fall in love with the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But those are gods of this world, and all of that's passing away. It will not last. But what will last is the word of God inside of you and inside of me. It not only causes us to learn that just not that just our sins are forgiven, but that we, we grow and we're a child under instruction and we become a young man or a young woman in the faith and we're strong and we're overcoming the wicked one because the word of God's in us and we become a spiritual father and the lure of the world cannot overcome the power of God's word in you. Demas? My friend in Bible school didn't stay in the Word. You, you can. You can get back in it. You can fall in love with God and His Word all over again. So it feeds your soul. And it gives you the right ideas so that you're not thinking the way the world thinks, but the way God thinks instead.
Let's pray together. Father, we want to just say to you that we thank you for these past number of weeks where you've revealed to us the gods that are at war in our own lives and vying for our attention and our affections. You've shown us, you've taught us, you've helped us to see, and you've helped us make choices. You've helped us to respond to what your word has said. You've helped us and given us power by your spirit to make the choices that that please you the most and that we really want to make. We are tired of being defeated by little gods, so many of them. And we ask you again today, I ask you as we close out this series, that Holy Spirit, you would do a mighty, fantastic, supernatural work in each person's life in this room and those watching. God, Father, we need your help. We need your grace. The lure of the world is great. The lure of the flesh is great. The lure of my eyes, our eyes, is great. The lure of pride is great. But greater are you who is in us than anything that's in the world. So we ask you for your mighty grace to help us. We thank you for that. Jesus, in your mighty name.